All right, so um, welcome to uh, IGNIS webinar. Today is our seventh webinar in the series, and um, yay us! Ignis is the Latin word for spark or ignite, and that's what we're hoping uh, to do here today is to ignite your curiosity about our Washington faculty learning communities, and they're here to share some really great information with us about the topics that they investigated over the last year. So um, the topics that we have up today are using mindfulness and um, achieving QM standards and improving transition to college. So um, got some really great topics up. We have Olympic Highline and then Olympic presenting again. So um, we're looking forward to um, some really great presentations today. So this series is brought to you by SBCTC eLearning and ATL. And my name is Alyssa Sells, for those of you that don't know me. And I'm the State Board eLearning Program Administrator. And Jennifer Wetham is my counterpart, and she's the State Board Program Administrator for Faculty Development. And we're kind of two sides of the same coin. You may have heard of us referred to as the Dynamic Duo or the Wonder Twins. So um, <laughs> we're, we're going to get t-shirts sometime with that, and we're going to go to a conference, and you can all see us. Also joining us this afternoon is our fabulous Collaborate rep, Amber Goulart, and she um, has been so gracious since we started this series to attend and help us moderate and just help us make sure that we don't have any huge technical problems. So Amber, thank you again for joining us from the road today. She's actually traveling today. And we're so very excited to offer this webinar series to you. And again, we have a great lineup of presenters, and Jennifer will be introducing them shortly. And I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank our presenters for sharing their experience and their knowledge with us today, and um, to all of the participants, everyone who is attending. So um, thank you, thank you, everyone. This session will be recorded, and you can access that recording on the ATL blog. And here's the link to the blog. You can type IGNIS into the search, and you'll come up with an IGNIS page. Or you can just go straight here to this next link, and it will take you right directly to the IGNIS information. Jennifer's done a great job of keeping that all organized and keeping it looking nice so that you guys can go back in and look at or um, review and take surveys and um, listen to recordings and stuff. And so, I actually, um, if, if I could just break in really quickly, yeah, I ahead. also just learned about SlideShare. And, uh, and, um, and today, I'll be experimenting with actually handouts, thanks to my brave presenters. And so there'll be even more information, but it will be reformatted to be a little bit more user-centered. So just very excited about that. Great, Jen. Thanks. All right, so we are going to get started today by um, running through just a few of the Collaborate tools and doing a few quick little group activities just to kind of get us oriented and get us started. And um, if you have not already done so and you'd like to use your microphone today, go ahead and test your audio. You can do that in um, the tools in the upper left corner and just click on the Audio Setup Wizard. It'll take just, um, just like about a minute to do. You won't be able to hear the webinar while you're doing it, but um, if you do plan on using your microphone today, I would recommend going ahead and doing it. And then um, if you want to test it, you can um, click on the Talk button, and if you get a little blue microphone next to your name, that means that it's working. All right, so here's our meeting interface. On the right-hand side, we have our whiteboard. And that skinny little strip in the middle are our whiteboard tools. We're going to be using those here in just a second. Upper left panel is the audio video window, and that's where you can see my smiling face right now. And then in the participants pane, you can see a list of names of everyone who is in the webinar with us. Moderators will be at the top of the list. And on the bottom left, we have our chat. OK, so um, as a participant, you have several tools at your disposal. There's a little smiley face icon there, and um, that is for um, expressing applause, or giving us a thumbs up for a good job, or giving us a smiley face. There's um, some emoticons in there that are kind of fun, and they'll show underneath your name. I'll do one now and give you all a smiley face. So if you look at the very top of the panel, you can see the smiley face under my name. OK, and then we have a button for step away. That's the little person with the clock. And if you need to step away from our webinar today, please feel free to do so and go ahead and click that so that we know that you're not here right now. 
And the next one over is the raise your hand. If you would like to speak, feel free to click that button and um, we'll call on you in um, a timely manner and um, it will put the comments in order. So if two or three people raise their hands, it'll put you as one, two, three and um, I'll do that right now so you can see what that looks like. So I'm the first one who would like to raise their hand and speak. It's just like raising your hand in the classroom. All right, um, the last one there with the check mark is a polling tool. And actually, I'm going to change that right now because our poll is actually not a yes-no polling. It is um, an ABC. So I'm going to go ahead and change that real quick. So you'll see that in our panel now, it's actually an A, B, C, D, E um, option. It just has an A on it now. All right, um, next to your name, again, if you're using your audio, when you have the blue microphone to the right of your name, that means your talk button is on and we can hear you. And that means we hear what you're doing, too. We hear your breathing. We hear your typing. So make sure um, when you're talking that you have the talk button on. And when you're finished, please go ahead and click that to turn it off. All right, moving on, we have our chat box, and that's, again, the lower left. Feel free to type into the chat box. That's where I pasted in those links a minute ago. And there's a chat for moderators and a chat for everyone who's participating. So um, we'll just be using uh, the one for everyone today. And just type your comments in there as we go. And we are running on um, an Ignite format today. So we're not going to interrupt our presenters while they're speaking because they're going to be doing short presentations. So if you have comments or questions about their material or information um, you want to share with the group on that particular topic, please go ahead and just put it into the chat and we'll revisit that toward the end of the session when we do our question and answer. All right, back to our whiteboard tools. That skinny little toolbar in the middle has uh, tools for our whiteboard. You can practice on this slide. I want you to go to that little tool and I want you to locate the one that looks like a sun. And you can hover over that tool and um, if you hover and click on it, it will expand and give you some options. I'm going to choose a smiley face as my pointer and if you can see the smiley face that's right there. If you want to go ahead and practice that, please do because we're going to do a little activity on our next slide using this. Okay, folks, I need you to play with me. Jen. She Practice had to drop it. off. There we go. But she's coming back. All right. OK. Oh, Jen dropped out. Sorry. Well, thank you, Amber, for participating. All right. It's always more fun with a friend, right? OK, Lovely. next slide, we have our uh, map. This is just a fun little thing that we do because we are interested in you guys and we want to know where you are. So if you'll use your pointer tool that we looked at on the last slide, and um, if you can locate where you are on the map and give us a shout out where you are. I'm in Everett, so there's my smiley face up there. All right, we got some folks in Walla Walla, people in King County. Obviously, we have some people out by Olympic College. So um, it's kind of fun to see where everybody's at. Ah, oh, we got somebody off grid. You must be out of Washington. That's always fun to see. Uh, we kind of we're kind of presumptuous in assuming everyone here is going to be from Washington, but we have had um, some people from Oregon, and I think maybe somebody from Idaho joined us once too. Okay, um, this is our next little um, activity that we're going to do, and this is just a quick poll. We are curious as to who you are, if you're full-time or part-time faculty, if you're an administrator or staff or other. And this must be an old slide because at one point um, we had changed this and librarians were on here. So I will apologize to any librarians in the audience today that you're in the other category today. So um, go ahead and click on your... Um, polling tool, and I am an administrator, so I'm going to select C, and if you scroll through the list, you can see um, who's answered and what answer they gave, and then let me go up to our polling tools, and I will publish our results, and then you'll all see. So we had uh, lots of full-time faculty, a few part-timers with us today. Looks like we have administrators and staff, so we've got a good cross-section of people joining us today. All right, and just some quick meeting netiquette. If you need to speak, please raise your hand and we'll call on you. Uh, use those emoticons to indicate a job well done or give your approval. Click that talk button if you're going to be speaking and then make sure to turn it off when you're not speaking and type your questions into the chat as we go. 
All right, well, that's my timer, and I'm going to turn this over to Jen real quick. She has just a few introductory slides to walk us through, and then we'll get our presenters going. And Alyssa, thank you for that lovely intro to collaborate. Um, you always do such a nice job with that, so thank you. You're most welcome. Um, OK, so I just wanted to talk for a second about what a faculty learning community is, for those of you who may not be familiar but wanted to attend because of the topics. And um, it's a, a year-long collaboration where faculty build their own curriculum around a topic that they are interested in for their own professional learning or, develop, or development. Um, you could select a focus course or a project to try out innovations. You could assess resulting student learning. You could prepare a course. You could do a mini portfolio. Um, you can work with students. Um, you can present your results at a national conference or just to the campus. Um, evidence shows that, that participating in an FLC increases faculty interest in teaching and learning. And most importantly, it provides safety and support for faculty to learn. Because as we know, learning is not linear. Learning oftentimes involves discomfort, taking risks. And so this is a really nice way for faculty to mentor each other and to try out something new. Um, there's two types of FLCs. There's a cohort-based FLC, um, and this is oftentimes a group that has been marginalized in some way by the university, um, and, you know, and they need a safe space to talk about issues that are of interest to them. A topic-based FLC oftentimes addresses a special campus or a divisional teaching and learning need. And, um, and we're going to see examples of both kinds of FLCs today. So oops, and of course now the, the slides are, I, I was having a little bit of trouble with the slides today. So we're going to start today with Jess Thompson um, presenting on their engaging and accessible um, FLC. So Jess Thompson, when you are ready, take it away. Thanks, Jen. Um, so here at Olympic College, there was a group of us that were focused on um, how to make our courses engaging as well as accessible um, using Quality Matters standards um, as our guide. So we focused on Quality Matters Standard 6 and Standard 8. Standard 6 focuses on choosing and using media effectively. And then Standard 8 focuses on addressing accessibility. So we made sure everyone in our group had completed Quality Matters training. Um, just last Friday, we actually brought a trainer in to cover both of these Standard 6 and Standard 8. Um, I guess standards <laughs> from Quality Matters. Some of the resources that we used, um, we started with web accessibility checklists as a way to, our, our goal was to kind of self-audit our courses, and then also universal design for learning. That was kind of our overarching approach, what we wanted to keep in mind when we talked about everything. And then we found a book by Norman Coombs, Making Online Teaching Accessible, Inclusive Course Design for Students with Disabilities. We found that really useful because it was kind of just straightforward, technical, step-by-step, -step, how to make accessible documents, PowerPoints, math equations. Um, so it was a really good kind of reference tool to use. Even though we had these resources, we were still, and I would say we still are, completely overwhelmed. Um, it's a lot to take in, and I feel like the majority of the year was really spent just kind of re reframing the way that I think about material, um, the, the way in which I think of something as good or accessible, useful. Um, and so that, that kind of paradigm shift is, I think, still occurring for a lot of us. And by no means do we feel like experts, um, but, but we recognize it's a really kind of complicated issue. And so our goal was um, to just try and keep it as simple as possible. Part of the reason, or part of the problems that we ran into is that the accessibility checklist that we thought would be so simple to use were a completely different language. Um, we had faculty from English, social sciences, math, um, natural sciences, 
And we had some engaged in CIS, but for the most part, none of us really understood the language of the accessibility checklist. So we started spending a lot of time simply translating those checklists and, and realized that was one problem in and of itself. That tool kind of became an obstacle. And then we also found that some technologies could be a solution um, for certain challenges, but then a barrier for others. Uh, so it really becomes complicated because there's no one quick fix or one way to do things in order for the content to be accessible to all students. Um, so what might be a solution to for a deaf student could actually be a barrier for a blind student. Um, and that just goes to show kind of what a complex issue this is. So the trick is um, what we found is to really just try and keep it simple. And that's what we're going to try and focus on in this presentation um, is making sure that you don't feel completely overwhelmed um, and, and frustrated, but, but that there are really small things that we can all do to make our content more accessible. And the first thing, and this was repeated over and over in the Coombs book, was to simply begin with text. Um, and luckily, I think that's a relief for a lot of us, um, where our materials are already text-based. Um, it gives us a guiding point that, that's already, you know, a foundation that we've already laid. From there, you want to use the headings and style guide. And luckily, these are built into Microsoft Word and PowerPoint. So I just want to show you real quick. The style guides are up at the top of um, the editing screen when you're in Microsoft Word. And essentially what these do is for a student with a screen reader, it's able to kind of chunk up the material so that they can quickly go from section to section and not have to have that screen reader read it all the way through. Additionally, in PowerPoint, what that means is selecting one of the layout designs that they already have available. Um, same thing, a screen reader will know kind of what order to read everything in. A lot of us, when we're doing, you know, PowerPoints or we're kind of composing our pages on Canvas, we like to add visuals. And that helps make the course engaging and helps with visual learners. But we also want to be sure to provide alt text with our images. And if you're in Word, that simply means right-clicking on the image. And you can see in the menu, um, there's the little box to do the alt text. And that's where you want to provide a description of what that image conveys. So that a student who can't see the picture can still understand the purpose of the picture. Additionally, more and more people are creating audio and video for their lectures. And what's important here is um, using that text that you started with to provide a transcript or caption. So that text can, be, can actually act as a script when you are recording your lecture. And that helps make it accessible. Also, and lastly, it's recognizing that faculty have buying power. Um, a lot of us use materials from publishers, and we really want to make sure to kind of let those publishers know that accessibility is important to us and that we don't want to adopt materials that aren't accessible for all students. Um, and so being conscious of what materials we're using is, is really important. So the key point that um, I hope everyone remembers is to just keep it simple. Start with text and then build your materials from there and really leverage your buying power when selecting textbooks and interacting with publishers. So links, or excuse me, so Jen has provided a link um, to a sign that you can post on your door, um, just letting, know, letting the publisher reps know that you're committed to accessibility um, and that these are questions you expect them to be able to answer about their materials. What I also want to add is um, I've heard from a couple of people at other colleges around the state who have use this sign, and they're actually using it now as a way to kind of audit their own classes. Um, it's become questions that they can ask themselves to find out and to kind of better think about if their material is accessible. So that's it from this end. <laughs> Thanks, Jess. That was great. And I love that your note to the publishers has also served as professional development in more ways than one. That's awesome. Thank you. So next up, we have um, Highline. And um, 
Mark and Maria from Highline are going to present to us. So when you guys are ready, take it when you people are ready, <laughs> take it away. Okay, go for it. Hi, we are from Highline Community College. My name is Maria Maya, and I am one of the ESL instructors here, and my co-facilitator here is Mark Lentini. He is um, he's our director for instructional design. Today we are here to tell you about our FLC in improving transition to college and workforce with technology. Our FLC's goal is to improve our students' transition into credit classes or the workforce using technology skills required. We believe that our purpose and intention, integrating technology skills, into our classes will enhance our students' ability to transition. We had two discoveries right away. Um, one was that our own acceptance and use of technology was a barrier to our students, and the other was that some of us were, look, were joining uh, the conversation much later with little support. So as a result, our SLC provides the time and space to look at our students' needs and where technology skills are being used and where we can prepare ourselves. Um, we needed to look at our instructions to find a way to prepare our students uh, to be marketable for the 21st century job market. <clears throat> we felt that we weren't doing all that we could do to incorporate technology into our teaching, and we wondered why. So it turned out that our first challenges we had was dealing with our own attitudes and fears about our own technology skills um, so that we could effectively teach those skills to our students. So um, in addition, we were integrating technology in our teaching practice that was not department-wide and not strongly linked to our student learning outcomes. Collaboration was a hit or miss, and the SLC provided a platform to start changing this. And so here is who we are. Mark and I cast the net really wide in order to capture a broad representation of our department faculty along many different areas. The open door continues to attract more faculty who are interested in student success. So the FLC also um, continues to grow through department emails, invitations from other members, hallway conversation, and people who are attracted by our amazing snacks. We usually have a two-hour meeting twice a month. The first half of the meeting we spend with social hour and snacks. We lower the effective filter of our participants while talking about how to integrate technology in our instruction. And we found that this was very effective and engaging, especially when recruiting our reluctant users. <clears throat> while the second half of the hour of our FLC is a little more hands-on, there might be a presentation or a guest speaker to get us to the doing part and how we can apply it to our instruction. So now Mark is going to go over our FLC's journey to this day. Sure. We, uh, we started year one with brainstorming sessions, as these things do, and came up with all sorts of questions about technology, everything from how do I use the classroom podium to using Google Documents. And but lots of questions about why we should even bother, why we're doing technology with students, and a lot of concern about what we could expect of students. Um, and it went something like, you know, I have, I'm teaching ESL level two. Can I really expect those students to use Microsoft Office? So we, we worked through that really over the course of the whole year. It wasn't a kind of a one-shot discussion with a lot of show and tell, a lot of um, discussions with faculty um, sharing what they were already doing. So some of the some of the instructors would get up, for instance, and talk about how they had level two students doing PowerPoints. We also developed a list of skills that students would need to transfer to be successful uh, once they transferred into college level work. Our off-campus instructors had a real problem with technology in the sites that they were working, so we cooked up these kits. On the left is a data projector. On the right is a document camera. There's also a connection for a laptop. And the whole kit weighs about three pounds and fits in a camera bag. So this year, which is year two, uh, was really all about hands-on. We built in, built out three subgroups, um, one of which, for example, turned that list of skills that I just talked about into lesson plans and activities that instructors could implement in their classrooms. We tapped more campus experts. We had a business technology instructor um, come in and teach us Office 2013, and that was a hands-on session. Sue Franz, we're lucky to have her on our campus, and she came in and talked about productivity tips for faculty. 
we ran into a little hang up in that there's no food in the lab. So our, our, uh, much ballyhooed food and, um, social hour was a problem. We ended up meeting in a conference room. Participants brought their laptops or iPads or tablets and we checked out laptops for the ones that didn't have it. Uh-oh. So during the year, uh, we got lucky. The program was rewriting their language outcomes for each class and they included technology outcomes. So that was a huge win for us and really gives us our next step, which is to link our library of activities to those and start some assessment. Thanks. Uh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Those um, those pictures are just fabulous. And those are all from Highline, right? Yeah, those are all pictures from around our campus, some from the meeting and some from uh, students. Yeah, wow, that's amazing. Thank you so much to both of you. And Finally, we have the mindfulness presentation. And if you guys will just excuse me for one second. Um, <laughs> I had a little bit of trouble with the slides opening um, when I uploaded the slides. Although, now I can't get to my, let's see here. Um, so Deb I, Deb, I really apologize. And I'm just looking for where. Um, Amber, my um, I can't get back to like the thing that shows me all of the the slide navigation, and so I'm having trouble finding Deb's beautiful cover slide. And I'm wondering if I should just re-upload her slides really quickly. Yeah, you might you might want which slide is it? Did you see that they were mixed up? Yeah, you know I think what I'll do is I'll just re-upload her slides. And everyone, I apologize for the technical difficulties. Um, all right, so I'm just going to re-upload Deb's slides so they're all in one place together. And it looks like Alyssa found, or Amber found, the mindfulness, the cover mindfulness slides. So we'll... Yeah, it's there, we'll, but it's out of order, but at least yeah. they're on the right slide for now. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and while PowerPoint, is, so PowerPoint is generating the images and uh, that we should have about three more seconds. Okay, there we go. All right, excellent. And... Um, Deb, would you like us to move through your slides for you, or do you feel comfortable navigating through your own slides? Oh, actually, I would like to navigate through them myself. All right, excellent. Um, do you do you know how to do you see the page explorer? Um, is it the the forward and backward buttons at the top? Yes. Okay. You've got it. Okay. And for some reason, I just lost it again. Oh, my goodness. I'm sorry, everyone. I've, today is not my day with technology. <laughs> okay. There it is. So go ahead. Uh, okay. So, Deb, when you are ready, <laughs> I have your handout okay. link all ready to go. And <laughs> ready, set, go. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right. Um, so our FLC um, was focusing on mindfulness practices, and I'm going to explain in just a moment what mindfulness is for those of you who might not be familiar with the concept. But there's been a lot of use of mindfulness in education in probably the last decade or so. And there is research that shows that it helps to reduce stress reduction, and it also helps with focus and concentration. So our goals were um, kind of twofold. It was helping faculty to learn to use mindfulness for stress reduction and then taking it into the classroom to help our students with focus and concentration. So what is mindfulness? Um, mindfulness is really simply being in the present moment. If we check in with our minds at any given time, we'll find that we're usually in the future planning or we're in the past rehashing. And we're very rarely right in the present moment. And it's in the present moment where we can, one, find a sense of peace and also um, make choices about how we respond rather than react to situations. And as we develop a mindfulness practice, what we find is that we end up with a quality of attention that we can use and draw on no matter what's happening around us, which is really a wonderful tool in the kinds of jobs that we all have. Um, the first thing that we needed to do in our FLC was to acquaint 
faculty who are unfamiliar with mindfulness practices, with these practices. And there's a whole range. I'm just going to um, mention a couple of them today. But we did this in two ways. We had a workshop in November um, that introduced new faculty that had not been a part of the original group to mindfulness practices. And then we always included mindfulness practices in each of our meetings. And we would meet twice a month. We also um, made available to each faculty member who was part of the group um, a copy of Bob Stahl's a mindfulness-based stress reduction workbook, which is a workbook and a CD that allows anyone who's interested in mindfulness to really build a practice pretty much on their own. It has all of the tools and information. So that was a really good resource. So um, we introduced folks to both informal and formal practices. And uh, we used an exercise where um, people use their five senses to experience a raisin. And that's a way of teaching informal mindfulness in that it brings our full attention to a single experience. Another informal practice that a lot of our group members ended up using for themselves was um, something called stop. It's just learning throughout the day to stop, take a breath. When we take a breath, we find ourselves in our body. Whenever we're in our bodies, we're in the present moment observe what we might be feeling or experiencing in that present moment, and then proceed. Um, and this is a wonderful practice that can be done any time during the day. What we were trying to do is create a way for people to experience mindfulness practices without having to create a huge block of time. Um, and But there are also formal practices, and we did do some of those. And these are primarily um, sitting and focusing on the breath for extended periods of time. Could be anywhere from 5 to 20 minutes. So we used all of these practices um, in our meetings to help faculty develop a certain level of comfort with them. And then once we did have that comfort, um, the next thing was moving it into the classroom. And we, um, winter quarter had excuse me, five faculty that were doing various forms of mindfulness practice. Oops, I skipped a slide. Um, and you'll find this on the handout, Introduction to Mindfulness Practice. Um, like any skill, mindfulness takes practice. And it's something that you can build into your life in three weeks or less. And um, this is just kind of a strategy for doing that. So let me move on to the classroom. Um, we, when we brought it in the classroom, we, we really wanted to hand it off to students in a way that would allow them to accept it as their own practice. And we did this in a couple of ways. First, we provided them with a history of the practices. Um, and there's both a medical and a military model. These practices have been used for a couple of decades. There's a lot of research out there. Um, we just acquaint students with a little bit of it. And, um, and we encourage them to be skeptical about it as they start to engage in these practices. Um, we encourage students to ask questions. One of the strategies that a lot of us use um, is just a simple breathing practice at the beginning of our classes. And this involves um, kind of coming into the present moment, grounding by focusing on um, either our feet or sitting on the chair, and then start to focusing on our breath for several minutes. Um, and what's really fascinating is that this just draws and focuses the energy. And this is the practice that we most commonly use with students. What we'll do to kind of give, get them to buy into it or to accept it as their own is do it for a couple of weeks at the beginning of class and then let them anonymously vote on whether they want to continue it. And so far, we have not had a class that did not want to continue it. Another way of kind of encouraging student buy-in is to make them aware of how much medi or mindfulness meditation is in the main mainstream these days. Um, there are all sorts of articles. We've been creating kind of a bank of these in our Canvas site. Um, and one that I really like to use is about how the military has been using this, the Marines specifically. Um, and you know, students will sit up and take notice, especially in Bremerton, which is a military town, if this is something that the military is using. Um, we also encourage students to kind of thank themselves for taking the time to do this um, and uh, help to give them a sense that they're doing something to benefit themselves. In terms of application, um, I've mentioned a couple of things that we do. But we also have ways that we work it into infor informally into course lessons. One of our um, FLC members is an English instructor. And she uses both a raisin meditation and a very simple listening meditation to help students when they're writing papers to work with the idea of description. 
And then we have another English instructor who has worked out a really um, fascinating practice for helping students to recognize the hindrances that they encounter when they have to do a paper and they're procrastinating, and how they can use mindfulness practice, as you see here, to overcome those hindrances. Um, we have done some assessment and have student, given students an opportunity to kind of give us their feedback on mindfulness. And I just want to read a couple to you. I really enjoyed doing mindfulness awareness. It was a good way to start class and relax before class. I enjoy mindfulness. Since I started mindfulness, I've been in the here and now instead of always thinking of the future, which has helped me have less anxiety. Um, another one is doing mindfulness awareness has helped me think clearly in stressful situations, and it's made me more positive. We did some assessment with students. We had a, a very brief questionnaire that we asked them to fill out. And this is all from winter quarter. And it is um, understandably a small sample because we were just doing five classes. But we had students fill out a brief questionnaire right at the beginning before they even were introduced to mindfulness. Um, and we asked them three questions. The first one is whether they had ever practiced it for stress reduction. And then we did a questionnaire at the end of the quarter um, to see what had changed. And what you see here is that um, we have a very high percentage of students that by the end of the quarter were occasionally practicing um, mindfulness for stress reduction. Then we also asked them, um, about their understanding of the concept. And interestingly enough, um, quite a few of them, 62%, had some understanding of mindfulness at the beginning of the quarter. Um, but by the time we get to the end of the quarter, 76% of them understood the concept to the extent that they could explain it to another person. And then um, finally, we, this actually is not just in class, but in their classwork. We asked them um, the degree to which they practiced mindfulness in their classwork. And um, that went from just a small percentage occasionally practicing to 76% um, occasionally practicing mindfulness. And that's it. I'm sorry, I forgot to press and talk sorry, on my sorry, microphone. Um, Deb, thank you. That was wonderful. Um, and I really like the way that you included a lot of content, but you also really showed us what you did in your FLC. That is wonderful. And um, just in case people didn't see the link, I'm just going to do it one more time. Here are the handouts from Deb's presentation. So do we have any questions um, for our presenters about their FLCs? And feel free to either speak into the microphone if you have a microphone or type your question. And it looks like Jody from um, I think that's Big Bend. Oh, uh, Jessica's link does not appear to work. Ah, that is good to know. Thank you. I will, I will look at that right now um, and set and and make sure that I get um, a working link to you. Um, uh, Robin has a question for Deb. Wonderful. Robin, are you, would you like to speak your question or or write it? Oh, no microphone. So just go ahead and, Robin, just um, you type your question into the chat window, and uh, we can answer it that way. And I did see, um, while oh, Robin says, we would like to know how often would you use this in your class? Well, actually, most of us um, use it in each class. So for um, the three, the instructors that use the breathing practice that I, I briefly mentioned, we use that at the beginning of every class period. So it's three or four minutes right at the beginning of class. Thank you for that. Thank you for that answer. And Robin says, thanks. We love this idea. That's, that is great. And it looks like there's been a few questions about the Dropbox. And um, Alyssa says, just add on to the end of her name. And um, Alyssa, if you add on to the end of her name, what does that do? Um, Jen, her 
uh, link was truncated. The O N was missing from Thompson. It was just Tomps. Oh, okay. So you just have to complete her name. So that's the full one there. The first time it was pasted in, it was missing the O-N from the end of her name. Okay, I see. I apologize. And that should take you to Dropbox, um, where you can, and if you have a Dropbox account, you can look at them. But if, but here, I'll just do, um, I'll, I'll do the full link. This is a long one, and I apologize for that. Let's see if this works. Um, so I will I will play around with Bitly, um, but if if somebody could just click on that link and see if that takes you directly to um, to the handout. Oh, and Jody says this seems to work now. Okay, great, excellent, excellent. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for your patience. I, I'm um, I've been exploring all these new technologies, and I'm not doing any of them perfectly, but I'm excited for <laughs> I get better every time so okay um are there other questions for our for our our presenters Oh, Jody says thank you for the info. Yeah, thank thanks to our wonderful presenters for their information. Um, so, if we don't have any more questions, um, we do have a few um, we do have a few more slides to show, and so I'm going to take us to our final PowerPoint slides. So next week, we'll be doing um, FLC highlights um, on Clark incorporating the learning community model. Columbia Basin is going to present on their FLC and student learning um, or service learning. And Jerry Lewis, is with, who's one of those presenters, is here today. And then we'll also hear from other Clark faculty on adopting open educational resources for improved student learning. If you'd like to know more about faculty and learning communities, um, this first article is actually by one of our faculty members at Tacoma Community College, Joanne Monroe. And this is in a book called Developing Learning Communities at Two-Year Colleges. Um, M Milt Cox is sort of the, he's a national expert on faculty learning communities. And um, this article it was recommended by Joanne um, Faculty Learning Communities Change Agents for Transforming Institutions into Learning Organizations. Um, he is actually Joanne's mentor, and she works very closely with him. There's also two websites here about faculty learning communities from Miami of Ohio, which is where Milt Cox did a lot of his foundational work. And Joanne recommended um, detailed recommendations for initiating and continuing faculty learning communities in Cox 1990, um, all these different years. So he's quite prolific. There's a lot of information on faculty learning communities. Um, Alyssa um, is our program administrator for e-learning, and this is her contact information, and you can follow her on Twitter. And I am the program administrator for faculty development, and I hope you'll, con I hope you'll consider checking out my blog, um, because I do post a lot of professional development opportunities there that I don't necessarily send out through the listserv, and you can also follow me on Twitter as well. Um, we do have a survey, um, if, and it would be wonderful if you could give us a little bit of feedback, um, because we do want to learn and grow every time we do one of these presentations. And um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today, and I'd especially like to thank our presenters. And Deb, um, I just, I'd, I'd like especially to congratulate you for presenting your very first time in Collaborate. How did you feel? Oh, it was fine. Yeah, I very much liked the medium. Yeah, you were great. <laughs> I would never have known. And um, Mark and Maria, your um, thank you for your presentation. And 
I, I just wanted to say I really like that you guys, when you started your presentation or when you started your FLC to think about technology to improve the transition, that you immediately started with, well, where are we uncomfortable? Where are, our, you know, I, I just think it's one, one of the best ways to think about teaching and learning is to remember what it's like to be a learner and to acknowledge where we are learners. Um, and I also, you know, the, the food thing, um, I, one of the, the 2012 um, evaluation for our faculty learning communities, one of the things that pointed out was how can you find incentives? And I definitely think food, good food, is such an incentive. Um, so just really wonderful work in your FLC and in this presentation. And Jess Thompson, thank you so much um, for your wonderful presentation and your great handout. Um, and I have, um, I've learned so much from you about accessibility. So thank you, all of you, very much. Any, any last comments from any of our presenters or any of our participants? Robin is applauding. Thank you, Robin. Well, thanks everyone for joining us today. Oh, well, it's my it's easy to support good work, Jess. I you know, and, and you are known for it. So thank you. Um one last thing, um, the applications for um, next year's FLCs for 1415 um, close on the 29th, so there's still time to put in an application for an FLC. Um, and I'm just about to I'm just about to post that URL, and I I meant to make a slide about that and I forgot. So let me just really quickly get to that. Let me just really quickly get to that website. There it is. Oh, um, edit, piece. That, okay, it's there it is. It's not your, your link, Jen, that I just put in. It's the uh, schedule for the FLC presentations for this year, so. Great, per perfect, perfect. And I just put in the link to access the application for next year's faculty learning communities. And that the deadline is May 29th. I'll just say deadline May 29th. So I hope that um, people will consider submitting an, an, um, an application for an FLC. All right, everyone, um, enjoy your afternoons. I hope that many of you get a chance to go outside and enjoy the beautiful sunshine. Bye-bye.